here today with Dr. Alex Mitchell from the University of Leicester to talk about his new publication in Lancet Oncology, Depression and Anxiety in Long-Term Cancer Survivors. Can I start by asking you to give a summary of the findings? Yes. Well, this is a paper that we've um, just published this week. And basically, this is a meta-analysis, which means a statistical comparison of existing work. And the sample size, the amount of data that's in that paper is quite large. It's about half a million subjects, although it's roughly 50,000 who are actually cancer patients themselves. And within that, we look at comparisons between patients and two key other groups. The first group is um, healthy controls. And the question there is, is depression or is anxiety higher or lower in patients compared to healthy controls? And in the second comparison, we look at patients versus spouse, spousal relatives, so basically family members. And the, um, the key question that we looked at was, were those differences apparent in long-term cancer survivors? So there have been quite a few studies looking at short-term cancer survivors, but this is long-term cancer survivors. And we defined long-term cancer survivors in this study as two years or more living with cancer. Although other studies have arbitrarily defined five years, and some may even say 10 years. And we did look at those in sub-analysis. So if you look at then patients versus healthy controls, in, that, in the early period where um, patients are recently diagnosed, we did find, as other studies have, that anxiety and depression are higher than healthy controls, as you'd expect. But in this paper, what we found is as time goes on, uh, depression diminished quite substantially, such that by um, two years, it was really no different to healthy controls. So if you're living with cancer and you don't have a further complication, no additional burden of disease, Basically, your relative risk of depression in the long term is the same as healthy controls, which is, which is good news, meaning that depression does come back down to normal, essentially, in most people who survive cancer, which is you know, a large group of people these days, given the advances in oncology treatment. However, the dif there was a difference regarding the findings for anxiety. Anxiety didn't consistently come down. In fact, in the sample who were surviving five years and the sample who were surviving 10 years, anxiety was substantially higher in patients compared to healthy controls, even that long distance from the uh, key um, cancer diagnosis. So that tells us that anxiety is still a concern, even in the long term, for cancer patients. And remember, there was that second comparison group, which was the relatives, the family members, usually the spouse of the patients themselves. And essentially, we found that anxiety but not so much depression. Anxiety was higher in the relatives than in the patients themselves. This is relatives compared to long-term cancer survivors. So in other words, anxiety is not just a, a problem in the long-term cancer patients, it's even more of a problem statistically in the relatives of cancer patients. You previously published a paper in Lancet Oncology in February 2011 on a similar topic, what were the differences in the two papers? Well, in the 2011 paper, we weren't looking at comparisons, we were just looking at raw rates. Now, although there's more studies looking at raw rates, the sample sizes tend to be smaller. So our total pooled sample in the 2011 paper was 15,000 subjects with cancer who were tested for anxiety, depression, or other related mood disorders. In the two, th this 2013 paper, we're looking at comparisons, but the sample size is much larger, about half a million in total, and over 50,000 with cancer tested for anxiety or depression. The other difference is that um, we were just looking at depression and anxiety essentially at one point in time in the 2011 paper. And what we found was that the rate of anxiety was about 10% across the board, which was perhaps lower than expected. There were only 22 studies looking at anxiety at that time, and we've looked at 43 comparisons in this current paper. If you look at the comparisons and look at the key finding in relation to anxiety, what we found in this paper is that if you follow patients for five or even 10 years, let's take 10 years, if you follow patients for 10 years, then the relative risk of anxiety is 50% higher in patients compared to healthy controls. So the anxiety is really significantly higher 
in those long-term cancer survivors, especially the very long-term cancer survivors. It sounds like anxiety is important. What are the main features of anxiety in cancer? Well, there's actually two questions here. What are the key features of anxiety in general? And then are the symptoms and signs of anxiety different in a cancer setting? So I can just address the second one first, because we can actually say we don't know the answer to that, but it's possible that the symptoms are different. And I'll tell you why I say that. We've recently published a paper in Journal of Affective Disorders where we looked at whether the symptoms of depression are different in cancer versus um, the general population, for example, primary care. And there were some subtle differences, although they weren't the standard assumption wasn't proved, which is that physical symptoms should be disqualified altogether. And we're currently engaging in a new study looking at whether the symptoms of anxiety are the same or different in a cancer population, but that data isn't available yet. So what I can really answer that question by saying is what are the symptoms of anxiety that are standard, that, are, that we should be looking for in general? And the thing about anxiety disorder is there are various subtypes of anxiety disorder. But in my view, the key one is generalized anxiety disorder. And in the um, American guidance, DSM, which has actually just had a new revision, DSM-5, uh, the DSM manual, uh, the equivalent in the UK, by the way, is ICD-10. They give guidance on what are the standardized symptoms of anxiety. So the standardized symptoms of anxiety for the clinician are excessive worry or anxiety. That's the first one. That's a core symptom. The second one is um, it being difficult to control that worry. So the worry is occurring at various times. And a nice way to ask that for the clinician is to say um, to the patient, are you having um, unpleasant, intrusive, anxious thoughts, which you don't want to have? The frequency of the intrusive thoughts gives you an indication of how difficult it is to control that worry. In addition, the anxiety must be causing the person either distress or problem going about their everyday everyday life, essentially daily dysfunction. Um, that's a qualifying symptom. They sometimes call that clinical significance criteria. It is in the list of DSM. And in addition, to make things a little bit more tricky in the assessment, you have to have at least three of six key features. And those six key features are either poor concentration or irritability, um, problems with sleep or fatigue, and difficulty relaxing or muscle tension. Those um, six features um, are on the additional symptom list. So the minimum qualifying number is actually three of those. And if you put all those symptoms together, um, it's actually the case that there's four somatic or physical based symptoms and four psychological based symptoms. For example, poor concentration, difficulty controlling the worry. And the, f the question there, going back to your, the, your original question, is does it matter that there's quite a high physical basis to, this, to the assessment of anxiety? Could that make a difference in medical settings like cancer or even in um, cardiology settings? Could that make a difference? And the very last feature that I must mention is another qualifying feature, which is duration. And this is highly controversial because the guidelines on generalized anxiety disorder are that the symptoms must be there for six months or more, which is really an incredibly long time. And in my view, that's inappropriately long. And I hope DSM-5 and ICD-11 will readdress that. So in that case, how can clinicians spot anxiety more successfully? Well, there's various tools that clinicians can use, or they can use the symptoms if they can memorize them. There is a question in the literature about how simple can the tools get. And we've piloted um, and now validated a local tool for the assessment of mood disorder, which has a specific assessment of anxiety in a thermometer format. It's a visual analog scale. And we call that the emotion thermometers. And actually that's available for free download. But that's basically one item on anxiety. If clinicians want a more comprehensive assessment, usually they use the freely available scale called GAD-7, which stands for Generalized Anxiety Disorder Scale 7 item version. Um, that is, um, it's been validated in primary care, but it hasn't been validated in cancer settings. So 
the validity of it is uncertain. In addition, there's an important caveat with GAD7. It doesn't follow the rules that DSM-4 or DSM-5 set. In other words, the questions deviate a little from the standard questions that I mentioned before. For example, um, they use the question, um, do you fear something unpleasant is going to happen in the future? And that's not a standard question in DSM-4. So the, those slight um, subtle differences could cause differences in sensitivity and specificity of the scale. Uh, to address that, we put out a freely available scale, which is um, available online. If clinicians want it, they can find it via a Google search for using the search terms uh, GAD for DSM. And the GAD for DSM-4 scale for anxiety follows the symptom checklist that I mentioned earlier, the DSM, the rules of DSM exactly, in order to give the clinician the exact qualification of whether the patient's suffering from generalized anxiety disorder. That sounds like a long answer, and it is a slightly complex, and it's even more complex in clinical practice because of the other subtypes of anxiety disorders, which we're not really talking about extensively today. But they include, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is recurrent intrusive thoughts of something that's been a severe, often life-threatening experience. And some people say the cancer journey includes qualifying experiences which would precipitate a PTSD-like PTSD experience in many people. We have measured the rate of PTSD ourselves, and um, we found it to be approximately between 10 and 15 percent in our cancer population. And there are other subtypes, important subtypes of anxiety disorders, such as panic disorder, and less common disorders, such as OCD and um, phobias. Is it the case that anxiety is overlooked in cancer settings? Yes, that's definitely the case, that depression, anxiety and other mood disorders are overlooked. If you measure the actual rate of anxiety and then the rate that clinicians pick it up, um, we know from several studies that all mood disorders are overlooked. We did a study on this recently, quite a um, large scale study, where we asked patients to rate their anxiety level on a simple visual analog scale. Um, we also asked them to rate their distress level. And then we asked clinicians in parallel to tell us who they thought was suffering with a mood disorder or specifically anxiety. And we asked um, that in 540 clinician patient assessments. And the results suggested that clinicians picked up 42% of anxiety disorders. That was the clinician's detection sensitivity. The detection specificity was 85%. So that, that was, that's the number of non-anxious patients they correctly ruled out. And their rate of detection, detecting anxiety was a little bit worse than the rate of than detecting depression. So we can say that anxiety is definitely overlooked because we know that for a fact regarding depression, it's probably more overlooked than depression is. Finally, what further research would be most helpful in this area? Well, one of the intriguing findings is that we know there's a mismatch between the rate of anxiety detected by the clinician and the rate of anxiety that's volunteered by the patient. So to put that in numerical terms, if you see patients early after cancer, then if an expert comes and applies the DSM or ICD criteria and looks for GAD or other anxiety disorders, the rate of anxiety disorders, and we looked at this before, remember, in the 2011 paper, is 10%. And that 10% rate sounds quite modest. It's lower than depression, for example, where the rate is 15 to 20%, depending on the definition of depression. However, if you ask patients to rate their own mood, and you separate those out into, let's say, depression, anger, anxiety, anxiety is the one that is most frequent, um, such that in that early cancer period, as many as 40% of patients on a given day say that they're significantly anxious. Why is it then that we have this mismatch between the 40% rate volunteered by the patient and the 10% rated officially by the clinician? Is it that the clinician is under-detecting or is it that the patients are somewhat, um, not preoccupied, but um, they are 
over-reporting in some sense, significant, clinically significant anxiety. Um, it could be a mismatch between symptoms and syndrome. That is true. There is a difference there. But I think there's more to it than that. And I think further research should resolve that issue of the mismatch between the clinician's opinion and the patient's opinion. A final interesting question is, what's the effect of cancer stage and disease burden on anxiety? And to give you an example here, when we looked at this in 2011, we did look at 16 papers in general oncology, and then I think it was um, six in palliative settings. Yes, yeah, six in palliative settings. And we found that the rates of anxiety were almost identical in palliative and non-palliative settings. And that's contrary to expectation because pa people usually say, well, uh, uh, patients who have more progressive severe disease, they're bound to be more anxious. And there are very few papers that actually address this and very few comparatively. So that's an important area for further research. But I think the bottom line is that what we've shown in 2011 and now in 2013 is that anxiety is a really important complication of cancer. We shouldn't focus all our energy on depression. We should pay some attention to anxiety. We should look at robust methods of detecting anxiety. And further, we should follow patients through past five and 10 years, even a long time after the diagnosis, even if they're entirely in remission. And we should also pay close attention to the stress and anxiety levels in close family members, as that's definitely an overlooked area. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell.